Trinidad Escobar is a poet, cartoonist, and educator in Oakland, California. Her writing and visual art have been featured in various publications such as Russ and Moth, The Womanist, The Walrus, Red Wheelbarrow, Cell Cafe, Mythium, Tayo, Magatha Magazine, the anthologies Wallonkia, Over the Line, Quento, and more. Trinidad has been a guest artist and speaker for the San Jose Museum of Art, Filipino Comic Expo, Lithquake, and the Cartoon Art Museum in San Francisco. She's currently working on her graphic novel, her graphic memoir, Crushed. Trinidad has an MFA in comics from CCA. My father's injury ended his life as a fisherman. It was like ending a marriage, he said. For years he loved her. The sea was a constant in his life. She was there for him. He thought he could take and take all she had to offer. The sound of her, the movement and salt. But she was wild and he had been warned. How could she? How did this happen? After so many years and now this, his mind raced with thoughts of betrayal. He surrendered to the searing pain that surged through every nerve, collapsed at the bottom of his boat, exhausted and defeated. His beloved sea rocked him back and forth. They remained this way until the sun came up, drifting and dancing together. So you're a transnational adoptee. A lot of your work is about your family back in the Philippines and kind of stuff that happens there. I guess, can you speak about why that's a frequent theme in your work and kind of how that leads into the project you're working on right now, Crush? Yeah, um, it's kind of a big question. Um, so I think that art isn't just the product, right? It's the process. And process is pretty much everything to me in art. Um, and when I was trying to heal from PTSD and also a personality disorder that I didn't know I had for my whole life, um, I decided to approach art differently. So it became less about um, let's make something cool or something meaningful in terms of politics and identity and instead let me spend time with myself at my desk. And when I spent time with myself, my art became more authentic and more honest, and um, that meant facing my adoption, right? And I've always talked about my adoption and had known about it since I was a little kid, grew up with it, but never faced the pain that it caused. So as an adoptee, you know, I didn't have any choice in leaving. I had no choice when my name was changed from Trinidad to Nicole. And I had no choice when they changed my birthday on the paperwork either, because I had to assume someone else's identity to speed up the process of immigration. So my whole identity was taken away from me. Name, birthday, uh, language, everything. And um, when I decided to sit down with my art at my desk every day, I work for about 10 hours every night. Um, I started facing all of that. Um, and that meant looking at my parents' stories, my parents in the Philippines, really examining that and finding out who I was based on who they were and what they recall and what they honor. So in getting to know my family and this history, I was able to heal myself. And I approach art like that, like it's magic, it's a process of healing and so a lot of my current work um, has adoption as its main theme, not because I just want to talk about it because it's important and it's a political thing, it's a historical thing in the Filipino community, but it is in incredibly personal and important to me. And I think you actually talked about, I think you actually talked about that um, in our original interview, which people can see on our website at Kearney Street. Um, Dot org, um, when we talked about the theme of here, and you kind of brought it to being here in your body, in the present. Um, and so I was just wondering, um, kind of, how does being a visual artist work on the body versus, you know, 
um, maybe an artist who that's it's kind of there's a more direct connection, like a performer or like a dancer. So how do you feel like um, being a visual artist and a comic artist like acts on the body? Yeah, I think um, so. Absolutely, with with dance and theater, you're constantly using your body. You have to be in your body, and with art, you don't necessarily have to do that. Um, with uh, visual art, drawing, illustration, you don't necessarily have to be in your body. You could just be right here in your mind, and you can be elsewhere as well and tune out. Um, I know a lot of artists who will put on Netflix and then they just can do all their art while also watching something, so they're not completely present. And I do that sometimes too, it's totally normal. Um, but if you are gonna sit down with yourself with no distractions, then it's absolutely a physical act. Your back hurts, you get migraines, your wrists you know, need a break, you need to stretch. It's a very physical act um, if you are paying attention to it. Um, so for me, um, what uh, Colin was referring to was um, my answer for what here meant to me, the theme for this festival. Um, for a lot of people who've experienced trauma, whether that's adoption trauma or physical abuse or anything like that, um, there are certain things that happen, certain symptoms that occur, not for everyone, but for a lot of people. And one of those things is dissociation, when your mind kind of drifts away from your body to protect itself from feeling pain. And that would happen to me, like, I'd be talking to someone and I would leave, that, like, automatically and I had no control and I didn't even know it was happening. And so for me, here means finally being able to be in my body, like finally being able to feel the pain that I was trying to escape and trying to avoid. Um, and it's new for me, you know, like I had um, a couple of chronic illnesses and I still couldn't feel the pain. Like I was going through like chemo and I, I was supposed to feel really sick, but I almost didn't feel it because I was associating so much. And um, so now I get to feel everything, <laughs> which sucks and is also really good. Um, and it's a privilege to be here in my body. Um, and so I guess um, going off of that, about like kind of feeling your pain and like telling that story of adoption, can you talk a little bit, so Crushed is coming out April 2017, can you talk a little bit more about the journey specifically getting like the book made? Uh, the journey of getting the book made, like like doing it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I started uh, writing a book called Rooster House, and Rooster House was uh, kind of taking the X-Men and flipping it around using um, characters from my childhood, growing up in Eastside San Jose, where it was way more violence than people imagine Oakland to be. Like, people imagine Oakland to be very, very dangerous, um, and San Jose back then was, I would say, like 10 times more dangerous. Um, and so growing up there, a lot of people formed gangs, a lot of uh, migrant communities formed gangs, and it was a way of protecting each other and having family. Um, and um, so Rooster House was about uh, youth who had powers that were um, uh, rooted in their histories, but because they're cut off from their motherlands, they have no idea what those powers um, mean and what they're supposed to be used for. So they're going around causing violence when really those powers are meant to heal and to grow um, families and grow friendships, take care of the land. Um, and then I went back to the Philippines in the making of that book and I got to, for the first time, really talk to my birth family. And that's because my, my husband is fluent in their dialect. And before that, it was all like gesturing, like <laughs> we would like play charades, try to talk to each other. Um, and uh, my family speaks what I, what I, which not a lot of people here speak. And so it's really hard to learn it um, for me. And uh, so I went back and I was able to spend a lot of time with them and finally have um, a clear understanding of their stories. And after that, I was just like, oh my god, I need to write about these crazy Filipino stories. Like, Filipinos have the craziest stories ever. And, um, and so I, I needed to just do it, and I wrote the script, the first outline and script, um, in about a month. Um, 
and then I went through a whole phase of pages, um, but I brought here, if anyone wants to look at them, um, that are not in the book <laughs> anymore, but these are the first, this is the first round of pages. Um, and then I finally, this year, started um, doing the final pages of it. I found a publisher last fall, uh, Rosarium Publishing. Um, they're doing amazing work, especially for artists of color. Um, and they're doing it all on their own. They're fighting their way through the literary world that's predominantly white and has single narrative stories. Um, so they're, they're fighting like heck. So if you can, go check out Rosarium Publishing. They're amazing. Um, and the book will be coming out uh, in spring, uh, April 2017. Um, and I just need to finish it because I'm not done. <laughs> it takes a long time. <laughs> Race has really been foregrounded in the national conversation around like the election, definitely with the Trump campaign and with Black Lives Matter, with Standing Rock, with you know just the other day with um, the like mail or family mm -hmm. thing. Like people are talking about it, maybe more than they have for a really long time. So why do you think race matters to comics? Race matters to comics in so many different ways, from the creators. Um, so I'll start with the creators. To have creators who are uh, creators of color working in independent companies or Marvel, DC, or Image is so important because it means we have diverse stories. Um, if we uh, don't have diverse creators, then our stories are pretty limited, and I think we hit a mark um, with Marvel and DC like several years ago where they were just recycling stories over and over and changing the characters, but it was like the same exact thing. Um, but when you have a diverse uh, creative team, then you have different experiences. So it's not like a token brown person is just going to come up with some random story and look, it's diverse it's because that brown person comes in with a whole different set of experiences that might be completely alien to everyone else. And um, their approach is also going to be very different. And in terms of representation, like having characters who look like the readers, I don't know, everyone knows what that means, right? Like <laughs> growing up, you, you adhere to certain characters and really love them and follow them. Um, and oftentimes, they were characters who did not look like you. They are often um, people, like I loved Rogue growing up. I was like, oh, she can't touch anyone, it's really sad. And I, I loved her so much. Um, but, you know, she didn't look like me. She didn't have any kind of experiences that I, that I did. Um, so I think having that representation allows young people especially to know that a lot of their own stories and their, their fantasies, their dreams are possible, whether that's a real dream and aspiration or whether it's, um, or it's also uh, their type of storytelling, like do their stories matter? And look, there's a character here or there's a creator here who, who matters enough where people are reading it. Um, all of that affects young readers like every single day. And it also um, helps with education. So if if uh, a student is doing poorly in school, a one way to make it um, an, a critical education, an education that's founded in, in real learning of the world is to relate it back to them. Like, why, do you, why, did, why does it matter that you learn about this writer or this, this politician or whatever, right? Having that representation encourages that and makes everything else possible. Kind of coming at it from another direction, because also, like, Comics is not the only work you do, and especially with like, communities of color. Like You are a muralist um, with uh, Three Realms, you are a poet, you're an educator. So what do you think comics brings, you know, we have these struggles that the communities of color are undergoing in the Bay Area with gentrification, displacement, police violence, and there are these impasses in the national conversation around race. Where do you think comics comes in to, to be a force for change? Yes. Oh my gosh, I've been talking about this with my students like for the past couple of weeks. Um, a lot of my students have no idea what's happening in the world. Like, no one knew about Standing Rock. No one knew about the inmate strike. No one knew about a whole bunch of stuff. And I think part of that is 
no one reads newspapers. And then another part of it is our news comes on Facebook through um, instant clicks and oftentimes people don't even read the articles, they just read the titles, the headlines, and then those are often not real or right or accurate. Um, and um, I don't think it's just the youth, I think it's become the culture, the norm, to, to read this way. And um, not to say that comics is, a, is like an easier form of uh, literacy, which it's not, like, it's actually very complex because you're reading pictures as well as words. Um, uh, comics allows more people to click on a story and be more interested and engaged because it has color, because you can see faces, and it's uh, more relatable. Um, there is an excellent story on um, the inmate strike um, on the nib, if you look it up, and you can see a lot of people's faces are erased, right? And and the artist doesn't say, this character's face is erased for a reason, but you can intuitively feel it. And to be able to instantaneously feel that someone's being erased in a comic that takes maybe five minutes to read or less, you, you, you just spread information so quickly, and that can that can go viral. Like information can go viral in a way um, that, uh, like comics, as the the vessel for in information, um, can be a lot more effective than uh, just a, a lengthy article. While I love to read lengthy articles, and that's like really fun to me. Um, for a lot of people, because of the culture, it's it's not very accessible, and it's it's. Uh, it's boring to a lot of people. They don't feel connected to it. But if you are intuitively being hit in the heart and in the gut with imagery that you can even articulate why it's affecting you, like that's beautiful and that's powerful. I think that's just amazing. I don't know if I answered you. I'm just talking. <laughs> we also brought up the like nationwide prison strike, which I think not a lot of people have heard of, um, and is not really getting covered in the news. So that new article. I think would be a great uh, starting point for folks. I know you just, uh, you probably, I think you just posted about that on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, I, I've been posting a lot of um, comic stories, um, comic journalism on my Facebook page just because um, I think some people will, you know, click on an article when they see a catchy headline, um, but then if they see an image, they're actually more likely to be like, oh, it's so pretty, I'm gonna click on that. And then they end up being, like engulfed in a story that they might not have read. Um, you're also part of a POC Comics Collective, or Vias Forge, whose mission is to empower artists and storytellers from marginalized backgrounds and experiences. Um, so what kind of work is Orpheus Forge doing right now? Okay, so Orpheus Forge has two projects right now. Um, one, we're trying to get this um, people of color co fantasy comic out into the world and it um, takes several different cultures and um, um, black characters and puts them in a, a fantasy world that um, uh, the stories kind of ride in, in this world and then simultaneously ride in the fantasy world. And um, we're doing this um, to do good storytelling but also because a lot of uh, black characters are not seen or invisible in um, fantasy, uh, in sci-fi and fantasy. And uh, that's ridiculous, because it's fantasy. You, anyone can be in fantasy, like anything can be in fantasy. Um, but we have all these like ogres and trolls and stuff, but we don't have like black people or like Asian people or, you know, it's, it's very rare. Like you have to go digging to find um, these things. Um, so we are putting out a book called Seawolf and it's gonna be an ongoing title. Um, and then on top of that, we also help uh, support other artists who wanna to go to cons but can't afford it. So a lot of um, uh, creators of color you know, are just working from their homes and they don't have like, a ton of money to pay for tables. If you, don't know that, um, if you don't know the process, to go to a comic con and to sell your work, you have to first pay a table fee. And sometimes that's hundreds of dollars people don't have that money, so we try to team up with them, and we share the cost, so half the table will be us, and then the other half will be another creator who has never been to a con before. Um, so it's just uh, helping people get 
exposure and helping people um, get into spaces that they normally are left out of. What does it mean for you to be here in the Bay Area? And maybe also answer, like, what has your experience been as an artist and an artist of color in the Bay Area? I'm never leaving the Bay Area, ever. I used to live in Texas. I used to live in Texas. Um, I, I'm not from Texas by any means, but I went there um, because my son's father uh, was from there. And I was like, I'm going to be a good wife. I'm going to go over there and like make a life in Texas. Um, and I didn't see an Asian person for about eight months. And, and when I found one, it was because there was a Filipino store that opened up um, like two blocks from my house, and I ran over there and I was like, I need mangoes, I need dried mangoes now, and rice vinegar, and I, was, and I just like hung out at this little corner store um, every single day, just trying to be around my people. And, um, and then I noticed there was like no seagulls there, because there's no water. So I miss seagulls so much. Um, and the pigeons are different, everything was just so different to me. Um, an alligator crawled onto my porch one day. I was just like, no, get away from me. Where am I? So, <laughs> I love animals though. Um, but I, I came back to the Bay Area and um, I instantly felt back at home. Um, and not just because it's where I'm from. It's because there's a certain way of going about the world here in the Bay Area, so different. Um, if you're from Texas, I don't mean to say anything like really bad about Texas, um, but uh, it is just very different. The atmosphere is um, more welcoming. Um, not that it, not that like people of color have uh, access to every single space, right, in the Bay Area, and that racism is gone here. But there is a very different way of looking at race here, and a different way of looking at art, especially. Um, back in Texas, it was like all about how much are you going to charge for that sculpture? How much are you going to charge for that? painting. And you can still hear that once in a while here, but largely it's like people understand the politics behind an art piece, or people have the right questions to ask, to, to dig deeper. Um, people feel inspired when they go to cons and then go home and make their own art. Um, it's less about, like, artists are over here and we pay them for things and then leave them alone. Um, here in the Bay Area, it's like anyone can be an artist. There's a lot of spaces for, for artists like Aperture um, uh, where, where Asian American artists might not have you know, any space or room in other places, but here the community has carved out several different uh, events and festivals and all different kinds of ways of bringing people together. It's less about competing against each other and more about helping each other Climb. And you talked a little bit about the kind of the politics of this place and the understandings people have. You have on the table um, Splendor of Wound, which you presented at the International Hotel a while ago, which is also where Currency Workshop used to be. Um, and we still have a very kind of strong connection uh, to that place and to kind of the movement that came around that. We um, took everyday mundane stories. So we took memories from different people. I interviewed about 12 people within a day. Um, just sat there talking to people all day long um, and was able to extract certain memories that a lot of people didn't find important. A lot of people were like, no one wants to hear that. That doesn't fit into the narrative. It's not about immigration, so why would anyone want to hear it? Or it's not about my identity as a Filipino. It's just a story about my, my grandma baking me babinka. Like, it's nothing. But to me, it's everything, right? So I decided to take these everyday stories of people who, um, whose ancestors, like grandma and grandpas, were from San Francisco and include it in um, a frame story um, type of piece. <laughs> um, so there are three main stories um, that are all tied together. Um, and uh, one story is about a grandfather who was, um, who was tortured in the Bataan Death March and then got out by uh, lying about his name um, and then got uh, kidnapped again by the Japanese soldiers and tortured. And then another story is just about um, 
a single mom trying to raise her son here in San Francisco, and because we've been uprooted and don't have a, a certain sense of community or youth, you know, didn't, um, he then gets wrapped up with trying to be cool and what that looks like when his mother has to go work and then he's he has to go hang out at McDonald's till she gets home, right? Or he's home alone for several hours. Like, what happens then? And who steps in to help parent him in the community, right? Um, and then another story is about a man, the main story is about a man who was incarcerated and some of us know who he is, but he was incarcerated for um, over 20 years and recently got out um, and saw how San Francisco had changed. So San Francisco is um, the, the place in this story and uh, you can see how the gentrification and the changes of San Francisco really affect him. I make an outline um, and that's basically um, what happens in panel one, what happens in panel two, and then I make a script. What words go here? What what um, caption, what narr narrative points, what dialogue bubbles. Um, and then I, so that's all text, and then I write a separate script of just pictures. So the pictures are saying something completely different, um, and then I put them together so that they say something new. Um, so yes, I think of everything um, and do like about three different scripts. It's difficult to find a publisher. I got lucky with the first one. Um, one of my mentors, John Jennings, uh, who recently won an Eisner for his black comics, uh, or uh, yeah, black comics uh, textbook. So look, look for that, it's really amazing. Um, but he recommended me to someone. And then that person ended up being an editor. They read um, my pitch. And then um, they signed me about a week after that. So I was really lucky in that regard, but normally, like for the second book, I have to develop a pitch, and that includes images, a synopsis, um, how long the story or project is going to take, what that looks like, if I have any readers, because um, they are more likely to publish you if you already have readers. So use the internet if you are making comics. Um, and then they, uh, I, I submit it to them, and to like 10 people, <laughs> or 10 publishers, and then um, I'll get rejection letters, and it's fun, and then eventually someone will say, this is really weird and cool, I wanna do that, yeah. But if, if you, anyone's trying to get something published, um, find out like what your favorite books are, and then look at, and look and see who published them, then look, who's, look to see who their agent is, uh, and then send everyone an inquiry letter. Like, are you looking for new books? Are you looking for a new artist to represent? And then from there, send a pitch package. Hearing about the CC program is huge, and then Jean Yang getting the MacArthur. Can you kind of talk about how you see the field maybe growing, or is yeah. that, are we on an upswing? We're definitely on an upswing. I think we've been on an upswing for the last, like, eight years, but in the last maybe um, three or four years, people have been taking comics seriously, which is so ridiculous because they've been around forever. I like to show, I like to go far back into history and talk about Jose Rizal and how he made a comic. I'll talk to you guys about that if you want to later. But he made a comic and it was about, you know, Filipino people and, um, you know, that influenced a lot of people when he showed it to folks. It was published. Um, and then, uh, you know, so comics have been around forever um, and people have seen it as a lower form of literature because there's pictures. And it's like, that's ridiculous. Just because there's pictures, are you saying that like big, huge paintings have like no purpose because it's a picture? I was like, no, absolutely not. It's completely valid. Um, so I think people are starting to see that and I think that um, Alison Bechdel had a lot to do with that, with Fun Home. Um, and uh, and so they're like, oh wow, you can use metaphors in comics, and you can you can do like real craft things, like creative writing stuff with comics, um, and uh, and it's it's a good thing. It's a good thing that it's becoming more popular and uh, the norm, but it's also kind of scary to see um, how comics might get controlled because comics have been a transgressive and rebellious form forever. You can say whatever you want and and. <laughs> And like, only, you know, unless you're gonna talk about the Comics Defense League and what they had to struggle with early on with censorship. But now, 
you can pretty much say anything you want and, um, and, and sell it from your home and it'll get distributed and be considered valid, which is just fascinating. I think we're definitely on an upswing. I think it's good. I think there's some scary stuff that might pop up in terms of censorship and control, um, but it's a good place. It's a good time to be making comics. Awesome, thank you so much. That's all the time we have. Thank you all so much for coming out.